There was far less traffic on the roads, and so traveling at night was both faster and more reliable. For towns within a 10 or 12 hour radius of London, it meant being able to read the newspapers of the day at the breakfast table. Operating on familiar roads, coachmen learn to trust their horse teams. Horses have excellent senses in the dark. It is also quite astonishing how much light can be generated from a candle-powered coach lamp. So the way these coach lamps work is inside here, there's a housing. And if I take this housing off, it's covering a candle, regular candle. And the candle sits on a spring so that as the wick burns down, the candle gradually rises. So you've always got it at exactly the right height, held in place by this housing, which I get that clipped in. The most important bit, however, is at the back. It's this parabolic reflector, a mirror-like dish, just like you have at the back of a car headlamp. It takes the diffuse light from a candle or any other light and focuses it into a beam. If you like, it's a, a funnel for light. So let's light the candle and see what we get. You've got to remember that these coaches were working in a much less light polluted world. And as soon as I put the reflector in, if we kill the lights now, it's producing a beam. I can see very clearly a beam, and it's angled forward down at the road. I can see the way ahead. If the night was both dark and blanketed in thick fog, then outriders with flaming torches were hired to lead the way. Whether it was night or day, the most important person on the Royal Mail coach was the guard. Good morning, Bob. Hello, good morning. Now, you're looking very resplendent in your fine red uniform, and that's because you are the employee of the Royal Mail. I'm employed by the Royal Mail to keep the coach to time and to keep the mail safe so it's delivered to its destination. And the coachman is actually just a contractor. Absolutely, just, just the bus driver. Yeah. <laughs> you're the man in charge. Indeed. A mail horn um, was for getting the road clear. The mail coach had free right of passage on the turnpikes, and the horn was to warn anyone in the way that a big vehicle was coming fast, and the safe place was out of the way. Give me a sound of the horn. That's, that's clear the road, that one. When you're coming up to a a T-junction and you're appearing out into a, a major road, the, the horses can see both ways as soon as you arrive. But of course, sitting here on the back, it's a bit like driving a, an Arctic from the back of the trailer. You've got no idea what's going either way. So playing the horn meant that everyone in, in the other road would hear you coming. And what about passing other vehicles on the road? I could tell them which side I was going to pass them on. I could play near side or off side. Give me an off side. you decide whether to say I'm going to pass near side or off side? Oh, it just depends where the good ground is and, and, and how fast they're going and where they are on the road. And you spot that or the coachman spots That's that? That's up to the driver. And he will yeah. say, blow yeah, near we'll side go, for We'll me. go over there. Yeah. yeah. The other important job that you have, of course, is timekeeping. Absolutely. Um, the mail coaches, people who set their clocks by the mail, time the mail coach came through, it was up to guard to keep the driver up to time. I carry a timepiece on my pouch. Could I have a look at that? Can you pass that down to me? I'll get that. What's this that, little that's key? That's a boot key. That serves as a lock on doors and things like that. Yeah. OK, yeah. And, to, yeah. and to lock, yeah. the, and yeah. to lock yeah. the mail boot. So that, this pouch is very important. So you've got your timepiece there. How reliable was that? Well, the, the mail coach, it must have been pretty good because the mail coach has had a wonderful record for reliability. The guard filled in a way bill and marked the times he stopped and arrived at places. Um, and the important thing I've learned, the odd times I've done anything like that, is never tell the driver you're ahead of time. That way, you never get behind and you don't have problems trying to catch up. There's this handy strap, and up we get into the dicky seat. Well, it's certainly 
a position of power. You, you can see the world from up here. But it's also quite a lonely position. I feel very conscious of my guard's responsibilities. There's the coach driver and the passengers up there, but I'm alone back here. I'm separate from them. And the mail is actually under my feet. I am literally guarding the mail with my body. You can't get to that mailbox without stepping off it. You know, if a highwayman wanted to steal the mail, he would have to remove me first. So I am literally the guard with my person. And in this box, I've got my pistols and my trusty blunderbuss. And to have a look at how these work, I've got to go to a different location. Chief among the guard's weapons was his blunderbuss. It's a short-barreled weapon, and like a sawn-off shotgun, a short-barreled weapon gives you a greater spread of shot. In the case of the blunderbuss, uh, that's amplified by it having a flare at the end of the barrel. The shot used was large size, it was buckshot, so it's heavy shot like this. So a big charge, it's a very thick barrel, so you can take a very big charge of powder. So it's a big explosive punch at short range. This is a weapon of intimidation. It's not a weapon that you had to aim or anything sophisticated like that. You simply had to face in the right direction. Ooh, look at this, look at this. It's a spread, but it's quite a tight spread. And it shows you that, you know, these are substantial pieces of shot. That's an extremely intimidating weapon. And to a highwayman on a horse facing a weapon like this, he knows he's got to stand clear. And if he's standing clear, he can't hold up the coach. As well as a blunderbuss, guard carried a pair of very large bore pistols. But like the blunderbuss, these were only single shot weapons. High women operated in gangs. So you may have killed one, you may have killed two, but there could still be desperate men trying to get that mail. Some blunderbusses also had a bayonet as a weapon of last offense, and all guards were armed with a cutlass, a short weapon useful for working in the confined quarters of protecting that mailbox. Well, this is a snug fit. The cost of the mails was subsidized by taking a few high-paying passengers. Not as many as the regular stagecoaches, which were completely overcrowded and overladen with people hanging on every corner, but just four inside and two or three on top. Now, I'm quite compact, so this is, this is fairly comfortable for me, but if I was traveling with a, a much larger passenger, it could be quite a squash. All this plush upholstery is not just about the luxury, it's about safety. There were no seat belts and coach travel was dangerous. And even for high paying customers on a long journey, they could expect to be jolted and tumbled and thrown all around the carriage. So even crashing their head against here, they needed to have this well upholstered to prevent broken bones and concussions. occasions when even expensive passengers were obliged to get out of the coach. It might be muddy roads where the coach was getting bogged down, or it might be a steep incline. They might even be asked to lend a shoulder to the wheel. But when you came to a particularly steep hill, you would use the services of a cock horse. A cock horse was an extra horse that you could hire at an inn, usually stationed near a hill, and you attached it to the front of the team. It just gave that little bit of extra engine to get the coach to the top of the hill. Many English pubs whose location is at either the top or the bottom of a hill retain the name the cock or the cock horse. Going downhill, however, was a completely different problem. The mail coach didn't have any brakes. 
it used what's called a drag shoe. This is put, the guard hops down at the top of the hill and he puts this under the wheel, like so. And then walk on, Mark. There you go. You can see the wheel is locked. You can see how that chain has engaged. And you can see the skid here. Then I, as the guard, because this is the guard's job, could, on a particularly steep hill, hang on here and hang up and really hang back, trying to restrain this coach from hurtling down the hill, using my weight to pull it back. Then when we need to take it off, if you could back up, Mark. That's it, we're clear, hold it. Now, if we'd gone down a stone hill all the way, that would now be red hot. Could fry an egg on it. So I have to be very careful how I pick it up. So I'm picking it up by the chain, not by the red hot shoe. And then we're gonna hang it back up again where it lives here. Rain and mud, hills and highwaymen, dark nights and driving snow were just some of the everyday hazards that threatened to delay the mail coaches. However, the Royal Mail took great pride in the fact that whatever the adversity, the mail would be delivered on time. Of course, mail coaches also ran in other countries in Europe and North America. However, the twin challenges of greater distances and harsher terrains made establishing an equivalent postal service in North America more difficult. Although none other than Benjamin Franklin had been appointed Postmaster General in 1775. The country from north to south on the east coast was either dense woodland or swampy marsh, and both were great obstacles to road building in what was still a new country. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.